The IPS Academy provides online courses from some of the best instructors out there on mental health, personal development, lifestyle, nutrition, relationships, mindfulness, improving your life quality, etc. Each course we offer has been made in collaboration with an instructor who has also been a guest here on the Inner Picture Stories podcast. Have a look to see if there's a course to your liking, read the full course descriptions and check out the thousands of positive reviews from students who have taken the course by going to innerpicturestories.com slash academy. With that, let's dig into the interview. Welcome to the Inner Picture Stories podcast. My name is Jelis Vaas, your host and the founder of Inner Picture Stories, the educational platform on life. I hereby invite you to come on a journey with me. In each episode, we will dive into the life of an inspiring person seeking lessons of wisdom about life and the world we live in. Answers that you can take away and use in your own life. It's true that no one ever said life would be easy, but it's also true that no one ever said you had to do it alone. So get ready and let the journey begin. It was only through coming to the edge of death that I learned how to live. I don't think I would have ever appreciated life this much uh, had I not been spent a lot of my life not appreciating it. Events in and of themselves are meaningless, I, I, I tend to believe. I mean, they're just things that happen. The meaning that we give them, the story that we tell about them, that's what changes everything. This is episode 012 with mental health advocate Mark Hennig. Hey there everyone, welcome to another episode of the Inner Picture Stories podcast. Glad to have you here. This is Jelis Vaas speaking, your host and uh, the founder of Inner Picture Stories, the educational platform on life. The main subject of today's interview is a most important topic that deserves all the attention it can get and uh, this topic is suicide. Our guest of this interview is Mark Hennick, a well-known mental health advocate and someone that some of you might have seen or heard of from his widely viewed TEDx talk Why People Choose Suicide, which has received, counting till today, over 4 million views. This is a profound interview with someone who is not only a professional and a policy influencer in the mental health system, but who was himself also a victim of suicidal thoughts. One fateful evening at the age of 15, Mark climbed his way onto the edge of a bridge in Sydney, ready to take his own life. As both of Mark's hands left the railing, a stranger wrapped his hands around Mark's chest and pulled him back. While this interview does not touch so much on that story of Mark and the stranger who saved his life, you can find a link about it in the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Both men, after more than a decade, met again for the first time. It's um, it's a pretty impressive story that also shows the kind of good-hearted souls we have in this world. Through the years, Mark has turned his demons into his passions, dedicating his life as a mental health advocate to helping those with mental health problems and mental illnesses. Mark is the principal and CEO of Strategic Mental Health Solutions, a boutique consulting firm that helps individuals, companies and governments move strategically from awareness to action in improving mental health and wellness. Mark is a sought-after public speaker and has appeared in more than a hundred television segments and countless radio shows, podcasts, as well as print and online features about mental health. And today, he's here on the Inner Picture Stories podcast. I sincerely hope that those who are listening who are dealing with suicidal thoughts or those who know someone who is struggling with these thoughts will gain practical tips and advice from a man who has suffered and has become a survivor. You can too. There is always a way through the darkness. And I can promise you that these words are true, having suffered for six years with suicidal thoughts myself. Be sure as well to check out the show notes, which are found in the description of this episode. 
Additional information, tips, advice and resources about suicide are found there. With all that, please enjoy this most informative interview with mental health advocate Mark Hennig on coping with suicidal thoughts. Mark, a warm welcome here to the Inner Picture Stories podcast. Thank you for having me. Many thanks for uh, yeah, coming on the show and to sit down here with me. Uh, there is uh, honestly so much to your story, Mark, that, and the work that you do, that it is impossible to touch upon everything here in this single interview. Uh, therefore, I mainly want to focus in this interview about a most important subject that deserves every attention it can get, namely suicide. I'm honestly very excited to talk about this subject with you because of the experience that with suicide you had yourself and, and the work you're doing today as a mental health advocate. And also because I, in fact, have personal experience with suicide and feel uh, deeply passionate about it. Now, before we dig within the main subject of this interview, I always like to start the interview with a handful of starting questions as a, a little warm up. And uh, the first starting question that I have for you, Mark, is um, do you have any um, morning routines, something that you do every morning to help you to start your day off on the right note? Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the uh, self-care routines uh, that I identified fairly early on to, to try to keep me healthy has been building in this kind of structure uh, into my life. And uh, part of that is is consistently trying to wake up at the at the same time every day. I don't sleep very well, typically. I just don't think I'm a good sleeper, but it's also partly associated with my um, my history of mental illness and, and trauma. Um, but I try to wake up early. I usually get up before sunrise. Um, I'll do some exercise. Often I'll do some extra, some um, mindfulness meditation and some gratitude meditation. Uh, and then I just like to have that time to myself to, to reflect and to, to uh, not necessarily do anything. Sometimes I'll read. Sometimes, like I say, I'll, I'll meditate. Um, but just to have that quiet few moments with myself, usually before sunrise. I, I try to do that every morning. What time do you start? Uh, well, what time do you actually uh, stand up every day, mostly? Uh, usually around 5 a.m., uh, and I know that sounds, <laughs> sounds early. That's early, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's, that's when I find I'm uh, my most creative. Uh, I've, I've relatively recently, uh, or at least within the last year, shifted into uh, writing more, and I find that's when I'm the most productive in my writing. Um, you know, coming off of uh, attempted sleep, at least, and I'm a very active dreamer, uh, and I find that that really unlocks um, a lot of my creativity. And, and I'm not as anxious in the morning as well, I find. Um, so it, it uh, I think, helps to wake up, uh, for me anyway, to wake up early. And I get a lot done between, you know, 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. Sometimes I get more done uh, before anybody else wakes up than, than sometimes nice I get an entire day. It is, yeah. Uh, you mentioned also some exercises. Well, you know, it depends on uh, where I am in my fitness at any given time. Sometimes, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, focus on cardio or weight training. Uh, often it'll be uh, yoga or something more more gentle and, and focused. Uh, but really, I think the key for me is, is just to uh, do something to prime my day, to get myself out of bed uh, early, to get my heart pumping uh, and my, my focus uh, in tune uh, early on because that sets the tone for the rest of the day yeah it does it definitely does uh, this next one uh, question that i have it's about your personal opinion so what do you think is the cause of unhappiness in most people you know I, i've ref had a lot of opportunity um i used to think unfortunately but now I, i'm grateful for it to reflect on this question and i think i think that it's um control I think that it's control of your mm. own life, uh, your own circumstances. You know, so often we fall victim to letting other people define us and letting other people tell us what our purpose is and what our story is. And really, we're the only people who can do that. Nobody else is in control of how we tell our story. So that's been something that I've been really um, focusing a lot on, especially in the last year or so that I've been working on uh, my first book, has been really that, you know, there's lots of other people's stories involved with mine, intertwined with mine, sure, um, but nobody else can interpret it the way that I can. It doesn't affect, you know, how it affects me may not be the way that it affects anybody else, but that's still an important story because it's the story that I tell myself every day. So I think taking control of that, uh, is what gives us the most happiness and purpose. And when we don't do that, that's what makes us feel 
lost and and aimless and unhappy. I think yeah, I definitely agree with that. The last uh, starting question that I have here for you, appreciation mark. Uh, do you have any practices or how do you remind yourself of your appreciation of life? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do some structured activity uh, every day. So I, I usually do uh, three things every day that I'm grateful for. Uh, I try to focus on something big uh, in my life, you mm-hmm. know, my my marriage or the birth of my son or um, both of my sons, I should say, um, you know, something big. But then I also I do a, a big thing and something very small, something very mundane. You know, the the Starbucks barista who gave me a free coffee or, or the way that somebody smiled at me or, or something, you know, nice because i think that's important you know not every day contains these big life-changing obvious moments of gratitude uh, and the practice is really to learn to be grateful for uh, and to appreciate ones. the mundane things yeah so yeah. so i do that as a as a structured part of every day but then i also uh, in a longer term perspective I've been focusing on being grateful for my struggle. And I, I think that that's important because we spend so much time and so much energy regretting what has happened to us and wishing it didn't and, and trying to change things that can't change. You can't change the past. You can only change the future. Um, so part of it has been shifting that narrative in my mind uh, to be grateful uh, for my struggle, be grateful for the awful things that have mm-hmm. happened to me. Uh, because what other choice do you have? Uh, so, and I think when you reframe that narrative, that's that's been a key to happiness for me. That's definitely true. And it's good. To, I mean, in the end, like every bad thing that happened contains like so many valuable insights and lessons that you can only see way you turn it around and actually appreciate it well that's it and you know events in and of themselves are meaningless i i I tend to believe i mean they're just things that happen the meaning that we give them the story that we tell about them that's what changes everything and you know that doesn't mean that it wasn't awful it doesn't mean that it didn't affect you and and it maybe shouldn't have happened theoretically but it did so you have to deal with it and and you can turn it into something good Mm, very true Uh, Mark, with that final question of the starting questions, uh, let's move uh, now into the main subject of this interview, which mainly will be about the topic of suicide. I'm going to start with a question that could sound very basic, but I I do think it might be good to start with it as many people confuse them or are not completely sure what they mean or include. But uh, could you explain to us what mental health and mental illness mean? And um, plus as well, the difference between them? Sure. You know, that's actually not a basic question at all. I think this is one uh, where people are often confused. I, I hear people all the time saying uh, that somebody might be uh, uh, suffering with mental health. And and that doesn't make any sense to me. You you don't suffer with mental health. I mean, you don't suffer with physical health. That's just a an all-encompassing kind of label for everything. So mental health is is uh, the the broader picture of of your well-being, how you're doing, how effective you are, how uh, productive. Um, happiness might be part of it, or contentment. Uh, you know, whatever your baseline is in terms of uh, being stable. Uh, and resilient. That's that's the o- overall picture of your emotional health or your mental health, uh, your well-being. Uh, mental illness, however, is something that some people experience. It turns out more people than than we used to think uh, have experienced some instances of mental illness. But I consider that like a an interruption. It's a something that intersects your mental health, just like somebody who's otherwise healthy might get a cold or they might break their leg or they might have get diagnosed with cancer somebody who's otherwise in good mental health might contract essentially a mental illness uh, something like depression or anxiety um, uh, or, or any number depression and anxiety are the most common of course but uh, any number of other less common uh, disorders now what's I, I think that's a, a key reframing of it because it means that um, Mental having a mental illness, and there are many of them. Sometimes people say uh, the singular mental illness. You know that I have mental illness. Well, you know you have to get more specific than that. I, I think nobody says that they have physical illness to mean everything because that could mean anything. Um, so that means then that if you do have a mental illness, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to impact your entire life. That you can be um, productive, you can be happy, you can be well functioning in other parts of your life. But there's something going on with that part. 
Uh, and, and that comes back to the control issue. That's important because it helps us to identify what the actual problem is. So that way we can start to, to address it. So mental health is, is the overarching umbrella. Um, it, it's part of your overall health um, stat- health status. And mental illness is a subset of that. It's an experience. It's usually episodic. Uh, it's, not, it's a finite point uh, within your mental health. So I know uh, some of the questions to come um, will be quite personal, uh, but if at any point it's a bit too personal, by all means, just let me know, okay? Oh, nothing. Nothing is too personal for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually good. Yeah. Um, so suicide is a bit more complex than someone just wanting to end their life. I mean, like, everything is more complex than appears on the surface. For someone who never had suicidal thoughts, it might be hard to understand why someone would choose suicide. From your own personal experience and from the work you do as a mental health advocate, what are some things you feel not many people understand about suicide or get wrong about it? Mm-hmm. I think people conflate the idea uh, that people decide to die uh, with with morality and with the, you know some kind of conception that it's a bad thing, it's an evil thing. Mm-hmm. Sorry, just one second. I'm getting a little bit of background noise here. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, is that your I'm sound walking in? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so anyway, like, like I was saying, I, I think that people um, confuse the decision uh, to, to end one's life uh, with it being a free choice and one that that person should be then accountable for. We, for some reason, uh, associate choice and blame uh, as though they're necessarily connected. And I don't think that they are. There's lots of things that control our choices, that when we lose control of our life, when you know we're experiencing a, a mental illness, and most people, according to many, many studies, most people who die by suicide are experiencing a mental health problem or illness at the time of their death. And it's almost always depression, though there are many other... Or there's almost always depression included, I should say, though there's many other potential causes. Um, and the effect of that, why that's important, is that though by definition, mental illnesses and mental health problems and crises associated with them have this effect of limiting your perception, of making you uh, not able to see the other options that are available to you. So then in that sense, when you're deciding to end your life, it's not really a free choice at all because you think you only have one option. So in order to have free choice, you have to be able to um, have different options in front of you and and hopefully with the right information, choose the one that's best for you. Mm. And that's not the case with suicide. Um, uh, People believe that It'll never get better. Of course, they're not psychic. They're not, um, they're presumably, uh, they're, they can't tell the future. They have no idea if things will ever get better. They often think that there are no more options or that they've tried everything. Well, that's pretty unlikely because we know that the way that the service systems are designed, people don't have access to everything to try everything. Um, so, there, you know, we see this happening all the time, these kinds of cognitive distortions associated with mental illness that make people believe, it convinces people that they have no other option but to die by suicide. Uh, and they, they really don't see because of their illness uh, that there actually are uh, plenty of options out there. You were 15 years old when, when you wanted to commit suicide. Now, uh, there's a process happening before you get to that point. It builds inside throughout the years. I, I like to first ask you, and it might be hard to completely tell everything, but looking back, what events or what led you to that point eventually to stand on that bridge where you wanted to end your life? So I actually um, explicitly started to struggle before, obviously before that event, um, as early as 12 years old that was documented. Um, but even before that, I mean, people started to notice then because I was really exhibiting some obvious symptoms of depression and of suicidality as early as 12. Um, but prior to that, I mean, my uh, family had broken up uh, when I was four years old and we had moved in with a new family. It turned out that the new family was not a good arrangement at all. My stepfather was uh, emotionally abusive, uh, really uh, very aggressive, uh, very stigmatizing against mental illness. I often uh, felt that I didn't have the support and that I was discouraged from talking about uh, my struggles. So I had no other option but to bottle it up, especially as a young boy growing up in what then became a, a hyper-masculine kind of um, setting, being told that you'd be weak or less than others by admitting uh, any kind of frailty or weakness or, or, or vulnerability. See, that, that's um, a problem about it all, actually, in the end, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, well, and this is it. That um, of course none of that is true. There's absolutely no reason not to yeah. um, admit that you're struggling with something and work through it, as irrespective of you're a man or woman or otherwise. Um, being able to talk is exactly what your mind needs to let that pressure off to work things through. That's part of the coping process. But I received messages from a very early age that that was not okay. It wasn't what men did, uh, that you just had to suck it up. And that really, I think, is what compounded for me. And and I also think that, like most cases of mental illness, you can trace the ideology, you can trace the, the thread back to a complex series of events. And I think it trains people, that people learn how to be depressed. They learn how to be suicidal. And I know that that sounds, uh, to some people that can sound a bit controversial because we, we're living in this age right now where we're talking about it as a brain disorder. And there's no question that there are brain uh, that the brain is deeply involved in everything related to mental health. Um, you can't have mental health if you don't have a brain. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense otherwise. Um, but I think that we're missing the point where these kinds of early experiences, the kind of feedback loops that I experienced, the uh, reinforcement that if I, I, I identified many times where I did reach out for help in some ways and was shut down. So I learned or had a very negative experience. So I learned from a very early age, don't reach out for help or you'll get hurt. Uh, and then that compounds and, and eventually led to the the point where I felt like I had no options. Uh, like, you know, my mind, my body was a, a house fire and I had to hit the you know, the the alarm, I had to hit the self-destruct button in order to get out of that because the suffering was just so bad. Secondly on that question, you've done a widely viewed TEDx talk titled Why People Choose Suicide. And, uh, well, quite a famous and well-viewed talk. And with well-viewed, I mean, like, really well-viewed with over 4 million views. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> for, for those listening in the show notes, I will link uh, the TEDx talk as well. But in your TEDx talk, you describe this scene where you were standing on that bridge where you wanted to jump from and you had one person yelling out you to, for you to jump and another person reaching out to pull you back uh, hearing you describe that scene actually brought to me this picture of a devil and an angel standing on your shoulders um, if anything was there any thought or some small feeling of hope that made you in the end not jump the conclusion of uh, that particular experience on the, on the bridge, the story, the second story that I tell in the TED, TEDx talk, uh, was that I was actually I didn't decide not to jump. I actually did let go, and I started to fall. Uh, and it was the stranger uh, who was standing behind me who grabbed me uh, and pulled me back over the railing. Um, and I think though that since that was my last suicide attempt. But that image that you mentioned of these two strangers, the the stranger in the and he was wearing a light brown jacket. That's all that I uh, I remembered at the time. Um, the stranger who who had my back, who was there talking to me, getting to know me. It's it's not like he was he wasn't a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He wasn't trying to fix me or tell me that I was broken. Uh, he was just trying to get to know me and and ask me about my interests and my passions and and what I loved and who I loved. Uh, and then I had this other guy, the the image of this other stranger who was only standing on the sidelines, and he shouted out for me to jump. He called me a coward, you know. The, so when I was hospitalized that time, and then for years after, um, I realized that I could decide which one of those strangers I could be. And this was the the very earliest. Um, seeds of me realizing that I got to tell my own story, that I got to choose who I wanted to be. Uh, and I wanted to be the stranger who had people's back. I didn't want to be the guy who stood on the sidelines anymore, because that guy uh, kills people, and I didn't want to be that person. That, for me, you know, in combination with, uh, you know, therapy here and there, as I was able to get it, but mostly that was a self-directed learning, um, I eventually found a medication that more or less um, helped me a little bit. But the thing that really drove my recovery was this discovery of my passion, of my purpose, that I needed to be this person, uh, this stranger, ideally, although the, TED, the TEDx talk changed the stranger piece a little bit, uh, <laughs> who helped people um, and, and who reached out and connected with them, who wasn't so fixated on fixing them. So for me, that, that having a purpose, having a meaning is what really changed everything for me. Have you ever gone back to that, uh, to that place? 
I did, yeah, actually. So after the TED Talk, uh, I went back to that place to for the first time. Uh, I looked over. There was only I saw for the first time that there was only about an inch, inch and a half of concrete uh, that I would have been standing on. So it was only my heels uh, on the concrete. How long was that actually ago? That was in 2003. Um, so actually, you know, long enough ago, but not that long ago, you know. Um, so it, I, I did go back to that place and I saw it, and, and the landscape had changed a lot. I mean, the reason that I went there in the first place was that my hometown was built up um, around the, the two world wars uh, as a steel town. There was a massive steel plant that was built there. Uh, and this place was the lifeblood of my whole hometown. But by the time I was growing up, it was abandoned, and it was falling down, and many of the buildings had been demolished. And so I think I went to that bridge, which stretched over that steel plant property, that abandoned steel plant property that had since become a toxic waste site, because I related with that. I, I didn't have any people that I could relate to with that feeling, but that place was how I felt inside. So that's why I went there. And, and now we know that most suicide hotspots, as they're called, or places where people seem to disproportionately um, go to end their lives, uh, they're not random, that there's some significance about them, usually some personal significance. And um, that place was certainly significant for me. Mm. How does it even feel for you, like, right now, after all those years? Like, how does it feel for you to think back about that time for you? Well, you know, I, I, I've talked about it a lot. I mean, I, I, I talk about it hardly a week goes by where I don't um, <laughs> talk about those stories. But uh, I work hard intentionally uh, to make sure that I never uh, objectify my own experience, that mm. I don't lose contact with the emotion of it. Um, and at first, that was very difficult to do. After I did the TEDx talk, not a lot of people, I didn't talk a lot about this publicly, but um, especially since it became so popular, I ended up re-traumatizing myself. I wasn't fully prepared to tell the stories that I told at the time. <laughs> um, and and I, I wasn't expecting that for some reason, even though I had, had talked about it for several years prior. But then in the intervening years, I've really learned how to slip back into that place, to feel those feelings again, but then to let them go, to leave them in the past, to not need to drag them forward with me and, and cling to them in, in the future. And that's really been revolutionary for me to realize that, you know, these experiences have happened to me, uh, that they were emotional at the time. And I can still remember that emotion, but I'm a very different person now, and, and uh, in large part because of those experiences. So it's good to be able to, I think, um, pull those experiences as they were, as close to as they were as possible out of my memory, but then be able to tuck them away again when, when I'm done with them. Um, and, and that's been uh, very helpful for me. Mm. While uh, the process of healing takes time, how did the recovery look like for you? And what do you feel was ultimately the thing that made the most dramatic changes? What do you feel really helped you a lot with all this in the end? Oh, you know, re recovery is messy. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's up and down and sideways. There's lots of hills and valleys. Yeah, I think um, for a lot of people, they're like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think for everybody, actually. Yeah. There's, I, I don't think I've ever encountered uh, a sudden a miraculous <laughs> moment, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, and that was certainly the case for me. I didn't suddenly find some doctor who saved me. And I think some all the time I hear about this, oh, if we only had access to uh, a psychiatrist. Well, that might be part of it, but that's not going to save your life necessarily. I mean, good, great if it does. I'm, I'm happy for you. But if we put all of our expectation on that one modality or, you know, if I could only get on medication or only find the right medication, that might be a huge part of your recovery depending on the importance that you put on it. Uh, but it might not necessarily save your life. Uh, that comes from within. That comes from doing the deep work uh, required. And, and it does take time, like you say. Uh, so for me, that was certainly the case. It wasn't some, I didn't find a, a, a miraculous doctor. I didn't suddenly find the best medication or the best therapy or the best situation. I just, uh, I attribute my recovery to grit and just to grinding it out and, and having a lot of really hard days. Uh, and a lot of days where I didn't want to continue, just because that was my last suicide attempt, it wasn't the last time I ever thought about it. You don't, you don't just forget that you've thought about suicide all of a sudden, right? So, uh, but but that was a, a good thing for me, and and you know I've come close many many times uh, to going back to that place, and it's come to a point where I kind of consider myself 
having gotten very good at being depressed, very good at being suicidal and, and anxious. Because now I've been there so many times when I'm starting to relapse, and I and I usually relapse once a year, once or twice a year, usually once. I can feel when it's coming. I, I know uh, usually when when I I start to. Uh, see the changes accumulate uh, when I'm becoming more irritable, when I'm sleeping more, when I'm eating less, if I'm not wanting to exercise as much. When there's all these changes from how I'm my baseline, how I usually am, then that triggers for me, oh, I know I've been here before uh, and it's going to suck, but it'll be okay. You know, this too shall pass. I've been here before. I've beaten this before. Uh, so it's less scary each time, I think. People think that that's overnight you'll just be cured of every unhappiness that you that you experience. Sorry to tell you, that's you know, I was raised Irish Catholic. Life is hard. That was that was one of the things that we learned very early on, uh, but that's not a bad thing because it unlocks so much beauty and so much, um, you, you know, you, you can't take the light without the shadow. Mm. Uh, and I think that's been a, a key part of my experience. It's it's underlying. It has underlined most of my creativity and most of my. Uh, experiences of joy has been knowing the opposite. So that that's part of why I'm so grateful for those experiences. Yeah, it's only I, <laughs> I mean, you you hear it a lot from people who really went really to a low low point in their life that mm -hmm. once they got out of it, they actually were able to see the real pure beauty of life because of yeah. that deep experience. And I hear this a lot of times too, and even from my own personal experience, and I think for you as well there. Yeah, I hear it all the time. And, you know, I'm I'm conflicted because I have kids now. Uh, and when my first son was born, uh, all of the insecurity, because I, I didn't even consider myself an adult yet, let alone a, a, a father or a parent. Uh, one of my first insecurities was, oh, I hope he doesn't turn out like me. I hope he doesn't experience the same kind of things that I experienced. And then, you know, I, I find myself in this odd place where, yeah, but I like who I am now, and I wouldn't have become who I am now had it not been for those experiences. So it's always difficult to carry those lessons that I, I've learned what I've learned and I've become who I am because of the struggle. Uh, but then you also don't want anybody to go through that. It's it's painful to see a family member, a friend who's struggling in that way. Uh, so I think the best thing we can do is realize that people are going to struggle. People are hardwired for struggle. Uh, and the best we can do is support people through that, uh, to to connect with them empathetically and realize that, yeah, life is going to be tough sometimes, but it's tough for everybody, and we're in it together. Uh, so so that, for me, I think, is, is uh, the most important takeaway from... Uh, challenge from struggle from suffering is that we're all we've all been there uh, and we can all support each other for someone uh, who's listening having suicidal thoughts feeling like completely lost in what to do or even like where to begin what sort of steps or advice could you suggest to them well first of all don't believe everything you think I mean, that, that's a trap that I fell into so many times, that you believe that you need to die, you believe that you want to die, uh, and you don't. And, and I know that, you know, somebody who, who just heard me say that, who really believes that they want to die, is going to disagree with me. But when you come through it, when you come to the other side of the tunnel, you realize, oh, yeah, I actually didn't want to die. Uh, I just didn't want to live like that anymore. Oh, so that's if good, that's yeah. the real core problem, right? If that's the core problem that you're you're unsatisfied with your life, that you're not feeling supported by friends and family, if you're feeling tortured by the anxiety and depression in your mind, if you're deeply unhappy, realizing that those are experiences that you're having validate that, but also you don't have to go on living those experiences. You know, there's so many more options than death that even if um, you know, even if you're absolutely convinced you need to die, then why not just try these other things just for the hell of it? If it doesn't matter, then try it anyway. Try therapy, try medication, try changing your life, moving, getting a new job, whatever the core problem is. Uh, if you've got nothing to lose, uh, and this is really what convinced me, if I've got nothing to lose, just dive in, try new things, uh, and you'd be surprised what you learn. You'd be surprised what you find out. That's so, funny. That kind of helped me a lot, actually, in kind of dark period of my life, too, that I just thought, like, life is going to end at some point anyway. So at least while I'm still alive, let me just try whatever I can. So, so I think for anybody who's who's suicidal, giving that a try is, is certainly worth it. Ideally, you don't want to do things that are going to make your problems worse. Um, you know, <laughs> sometimes sometimes people do that. They're trying to cope, uh, but then they start dr doing drugs or drinking or finding themselves in risky situations. And I get why people go there. They're trying to find happiness. They're trying to find relief uh, from what they're experiencing. 
But those things only make your problems worse. Um, so instead, trying to surround yourself with people, with things, with activities that you enjoy, that give you energy. And if something doesn't work for you, cut it out of your life. Uh, you know, you don't have to expose yourself to things that make you unhealthy. And that's hard, especially when it involves family or, uh, you know, close friends that maybe aren't as, as uh, helpful to you as you need them to be. But having those honest conversations, taking those risks for your life to make your life better instead of to end your life, you'd be surprised. You know, you, you get, a, you get a, a huge payout. Now, that said, if you're ever worried that you can't keep yourself safe, that, you know, this is a, that's a long-term process, taking those kinds of um, positive risks that will improve your life, that's a long-term process. So if you're ever not confident that you can keep yourself safe for the next hour or even through the night or for the next week, um, you know, go to your emergency room, go to a hospital, tell a doctor, tell a close friend, tell somebody. There's no reason to, to live this way in silence. If you're afraid that it's going to make them uncomfortable, fine, make them uncomfortable. I tell people now that that's what I do professionally is make people uncomfortable for a living. Who the hell cares if you make them uncomfortable? Um, if that's what you need, take take control, take charge of your life. Um, if it makes people uncomfortable, that's their problem, not yours. If they're not willing to help you, find somebody else who will. You know, there are so many options out here that, that depression is not only treatable, it's functionally curable if we can get people the access to the help uh, and the support that they need. There are tons of options. It's not like we don't know how to help people who have depression and anxiety. It's just getting connected with the right help at the right time that works for you. Mm. So if we would turn the roles around here uh, for a second to any parents, family member, teacher, or a friend listening who knows someone with suicidal thoughts, or at least assumes that person is battling with something dark inside. Um, first of all, uh, what would be the signs to look for of someone possibly having suicidal thoughts or struggling with something within them? Mm -hmm. So certainly if they've uh, changed dramatically um, from however they usually are, and, and that could mean a lot of things. Usually we would look for changes in mood um, if they seem to be more depressed, especially. Uh, so typical signs of sadness, but more severe. The, the, you know, their sadness is a campfire. Depression is a forest fire. It, it's, a, it's the same core feeling, but one of them is out of control. Um, so you're, you're looking for the forest fire, essentially. If, if somebody seems... Uh, if your gut tells you that they seem depressed, uh, then talk to them about it. Uh, there's no shame in asking. If you're concerned that somebody might be thinking of suicide, ask them directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? You don't have to hedge around it. You don't have to ask, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Or Because they're not. They, they might not be thinking about hurting themselves. They might be thinking about killing themselves, and that's a very different thing. You don't have to answer. You don't have to suggest to them what their answer should be before they answer. In, you know, in terms of asking leading questions, so you don't have to th say things like, "Are you thinking about doing something bad? Are you thinking about doing something stupid?" Um, you know, the, because those are judging questions, and, and you want to avoid those. Yeah, um, yeah. But we know that one of the best ways to prevent suicide is to ask people directly if they're thinking about killing themselves. Uh, and if you don't know what to do, if they say yes, that's okay too. You can offer to get them the help that they need. You, it's perfectly okay to say to them, look, I don't know what to do. This isn't my area. I'm not a therapist or a doctor or whatever, but I'm willing to help you find out. And that's that process, that connection is even more meaningful for people who are struggling than uh, than necessarily the help itself. The help, the help helps, but the process and the support of others around you, that's key. If you're a friend or family member, try to avoid being the person's doctor, being the person's fixer. Um, focus on their strengths. Focus on the things that they're doing well. Uh, don't discount the struggle. Don't discount the difficulty that they're having. Be willing to listen to that. But try not to only focus on their frailty and on their brokenness because they want you to be their friend. They want you to be their connection. Uh, they don't want you necessarily to be their fixer all the time. Secondly, on that question, and you, you pretty much already um, answered a lot of that right now, but maybe something more comes up, but what words of advice and steps could you re recommend to that parent, family member, teacher, or, or friend to possibly help that person? So, yeah, I mean, recognizing that the struggle that they're going through has a lot of different contributing factors, and that their struggle is real. That just because uh, you think their life is great, 
that doesn't mean that they see it that way. Even if objectively they have all the money in the world, they have people who love them, they have great, um, they have all all the food they can eat, they have everything that you think is important. They might not receive it that way, and that's that's the definition of a mental illness. It's a it's a problem with the filter uh, through which you see the world. It doesn't matter how the world actually is. Um, that that the when you're looking at the world through the lens of depression, everything seems worse uh, than it may be uh, in in reality. So appreciating that, um, but also letting them have their struggle. That they're entitled to their struggle. You don't have to solve all their problems, um, but you can make the <clears throat> you can make it somewhat more bearable for them. You can be a safe person for them, uh, and let them know that. Let them know that you're there for them. That you're not going to force them to do anything. Uh, but you're there for them if if they need you. That will go a very long way. Mm, that's some beautiful advice and uh, very helpful, actually, too. Uh, Mark, I just have a handful of more questions uh, here for you. If you look at some of the statistics on suicide, and, and not just suicide alone, also depression and loneliness, it's, well, quite shocking, but, uh, like, since recent years now, it's only been increasing both in men and women all around the world. Seeing this, what are your thoughts on that? And also, how would you say by doing what more could we start seeing a decrease in, in suicide rates? Well, I think part of it is um, measurement. Part of it is that people have always been struggling. Now we're just actually starting to measure it better. We're starting to get a better sense of the problem. Um, but also, I think we're also entering into a phase of mental health advocacy. Of uh, you know, We're talking about mental health more. But we're talking about it in almost exclusively medical terms. And that's that's an important part of it. Uh, the biological piece of mental health is, is very important. So I, I think that that's part of why diagnoses, diagnostic rates are increasing. Uh, is that because we're diagnosing it more? We're diagnosing more things. In some, in some cases, we're over-diagnosing uh, sadness or struggle or grief uh, as depression. Um, or, or other, you know, we're diagnosing stress as anxiety. And it, it might be. But it might not be, too. So I think we also have to be careful about over-pathologizing over -patholo uh, normal experience, uh, discomfort, um, about avoiding triggers at all costs. I don't think that that's productive at all, necessarily, to avoid all your triggers. That's what that's the, the function of an anxiety disorder, essentially, is to make you avoid everything that you're afraid of. Uh, the only way you can work through things is to go through them, um, is to, to through rather than around is the only way to resolve struggle. So I think that part of the, the uh, mentality right now is uh, that these are problems to be diagnosed. Uh, and medicated and treated. And it's always kind of been that way for mental health. I mean, the asylum days were very much like that, too. So, so I, I don't necessarily think that's the most helpful way. And the way that we can start bringing down those um, those diagnoses and the rates of those diagnoses is helping people to realize that mental health is a normal I mean, everybody has mental health and struggle, mental illness even, is a pretty normal part of most people's lives. Most people will get a cold in their life. Most people will get the flu in their life. Uh, and many people will get into car accidents and injuries and, and other diseases and illnesses. So therefore, most people will probably experience a mental illness at some point in their life. That's okay. That, that, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Ideally, though, we want to have people get the support that they need when they need it, stop telling them that they're broken, that they're incurable, that their brain is different, that they're somehow different than other people. They're not. They're somebody who's going through a hard time. It might be even it might even be a clinically difficult time. That's okay. We can treat that, we can address it, we can work through it and we can move on. And I think that's how we'll start to change change the picture. If we would go uh, a little bit more specific in this, uh, if you look at the gender difference in, in suicide, males do have a much higher suicide rate than females. And yes. with this question, by any means, I do not want to uh, exclude any female listeners, but rather tackle, uh, first of all, the wonderment and why that is the case, but also uh, to give a bit more direct advice to men on how they can potentially help themselves uh, or, of course, how we all could be more attentive and potentially see a, a this line in suicide rate for men. Yeah, so th three quarters of suicides are, are men. The large majority of completed suicides are, are men. Uh, but women have 
quite a bit higher rate of attempted suicide. So what that tells us, and, and what we look at the methods that people choose, that men tend to choose more violent means uh, when they attempt suicide. So they usually, or, or they more often, I should say, complete the suicide on the first uh, attempt because they're using things like guns, for example. It's pretty hard to take back a bullet. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to use uh, methods like pills, uh, things that won't hurt their face. And that's a very um, simplified way of looking at it, but it also identifies how we treat the sexes differently, how you know, we value the appearance of women, and, and uh, women have internalized that uh, misogyny uh, against them, that they need to look good uh, when they die. And the result is that the, that the means that they use aren't as fatal. But men, on the other hand, tend to externalize more. They're, you're, they're taught from a very early age to fight your problem out, that it's okay to use violence. Women are told that you can't use violence. you got to be polite. You have to be nice. You have to, you know, be a good girl. Men don't receive that. Men are, are encouraged to be violent and to be externalizing in that way. So that, that disparity, I think, that gender difference is accounted for by the different stereotypes that we impose on men, uh, on boys and girls from a, a very early age. So the way, though, that I think we can help men in particular to avoid suicide is to do more of what, what women seem to do much better at, which is talking about the problems. That if you're dealing with something, uh, you know, women are far more likely to reach out for help, to talk to a counselor, to go into therapy. Uh, and it works. So that It's not rocket science. They, they die by suicide less because they get help more. Uh, so if we can help men to do that too, to actually reach out, to admit that they're struggling, to tell them that that's okay, uh, that in fact most men, just like most women, go through these kinds of experiences, uh, that will dramatically improve uh, the, or decrease the rates of suicide among men, telling them that it's not a weakness uh, and that it's okay to struggle. Yeah, that's definitely the thing. Like just because we get yeah, definitely raised with this wrong impression that it's a weak thing to talk about emotions and that's a huge problem because so many things would just be fixed by just talking like just yeah just laying it out actually but it's and first not being not being uncomfortable with this discomfort you know yeah. that it's okay to talk about things that make you uncomfortable i don't know why we ever got the idea Same. that it's unacceptable <laughs> to be uncomfortable <laughs> yeah yeah life is is hard it's weird things are going to be awkward things are but that's okay we don't have to avoid that we can just let it be weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's actually good to know like that just take life like it is like just to know like yeah it's a weird thing with just weird events and weird things happening all the time so just you know <laughs> well it's true and and i think that you know part of that too is approaching part of what i I've learned has been to approach life with a bit more humor. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's always been key for me in my recovery. It's just a step back, even from one of my own thoughts, and think to myself, wow, that was a really weird thing to think. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that, or that that was strange. How did I go there so quick? And you know, so I think you have to have that humor. You have to be a little bit self-deprecating about it. Um, what else can you do, right? <laughs> Life is weird. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to laugh with things like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark, I just have uh, two last questions here uh, for you from the main subject. And uh, th this question might somewhat sound strange to some, but I do think you'll understand what I mean with it. Uh, in the end, of course, going to uh, an experience as this is torturous, it's, well, not pleasant. Uh, however, they certainly can and do, in fact, many times lead to incredible life uh, lessons and insights. If you, if you could thank suicide for something, what would you thank it for? Oh, no question for uh, uh, giving me the life that I have today. It was only through coming to the edge of death that I learned how to live. I don't think I would have ever appreciated life this much uh, had I not been spent a lot of my life not appreciating it. Uh, so, you know, I, I would thank suicide and my suicidal thoughts and experiences for giving me that, for allowing me the opportunity to recover. Not everybody gets that opportunity, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Are there any less words of advice or any books or videos you could recommend other listeners struggling with suicide? I also read you were, in fact, writing uh, a book at the moment. Could you tell us anything about that? Sure. It's it's a, a memoir. It's about my um, a lot of things that we talked about today, my personal experiences, my struggles. 
but also my pathway through the system, how oh, great. weird, uh, yeah, how strange and weird it was, and and how I eventually cobbled a life together for myself. Uh, so that'll be out early next year, early 2019. You know, some other uh, some some personal favorites of mine uh, that are out there. I love the work of Andrew Solomon. Mm. Uh, he has a, a really great TED talk on the usefulness of of uh, struggle, of sadness, of depression. Um, I love Brene Brown's work. Oh, yeah. um, she talks a lot about vulnerability. Um, she talks about shame and guilt. I think these are, are key concepts, and she has a, a TED Talk out there as well. I spent a lot of time, especially in university and in grad school, um, trying to understand the psychological and philosophical underpinnings of my experience. Um, and I think that that's helpful for anybody who has a bit of an intellectual intellectualization as a defense mechanism, which is what I certainly do. Um, so I've spent a lot of time reading, you know, psychologists and psychoanalysts, um, Stephen Pinker and, and uh, uh, some Freud and Carl Jung, uh, Eric Erickson. Um, you know, I, I think that seeing, tracing the pathway of uh, so many generations of people trying to understand the mind that's helped me to really put things in perspective too yeah it actually helps a lot to just uh, yeah read books on this just about some of your emotions to just understand them a little bit more because then they make more sense too so yeah that's definitely helpful uh mark uh with that last question i i like to already thank you for coming here on the show and talking so openly about this most important topic um yeah it takes a lot of uh courage to be so open about it, and I really admire that a lot about you and uh, the work you do around this here all. So um, yeah, the world needs only a bit more people showing this kind of courage, Mark. Before we do say goodbye and end this interview, I like to ask just two final end questions here of the show. And the first one being, what words of wisdom, what advice has helped you through your life? I remind myself all the time that this too shall pass that this moment that I'm experiencing, it might seem like the only moment in my life. It might seem like the worst possible thing. I, I may have catastrophized my entire life that everything sucks because of this one moment. So reminding myself to step, step back, give myself time to breathe, uh, and remind myself that, that this too shall pass. Yeah, that's a beautiful phrase. I love that a lot too. Um, before I ask the last question, Mark, what is the best place to stay in touch with you or to learn more about what you do? I'm very active on social media, especially on Twitter at Mark Hennick, M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K, uh, and on my Facebook fan page as well. Um, my website is www.markhennick.com, uh, and you know I'm I'm not hard to find usually on, online, so I'm, I'm very active. Uh, You're pretty easy, presence. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will link this all up the show notes for everyone to find. Uh, the final question here, Mark, from everything that you've seen, experienced, lived, and learned in your life. What is the one thing you know to be true? That we're all in this together. That, you know, we fall into the trap sometimes of thinking that we're the only person who's ever, who has ever felt this and that nobody understands. Um, a lot more people understand than you think. That you're not the only one who's been here. So, you know, I, I think that that's been uh, important for me. Mark, thank you just so much more for this interview and for coming here on the show. It's so much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode, everyone. I I truly hope it has served you well. In the show notes, which you can find in the description of this episode, additional information about suicide is found, as well as every link to everything we have talked about and, of course, how to connect with Mark himself. Do have a read through them as they contain some valuable resources about suicide. Let me end this episode with a few final words and the following quote. At any given moment, you have the power to say, this is not how the story is going to end. Just as Mark and I choose to do something about his feelings of suicide and turn our stories into ones of purpose and meaning, you can too. Reach out for help. Life is worth living. It isn't easy, but it is worth living. There is beauty everywhere to be seen and found, but it might be 
a bit foggy at the moment for you to see all that. But with the right support, by reading self-help books, listening to podcast episodes on these kinds of topics, going to a psychologist, finding a support group, finding a purpose or a meaning, and changing your mindset, your story can take a dramatic turn for the better. And that fog will slowly disappear. Take control of your own story and reach out for help. There truly are good-hearted people, like Mark, like all of us here at Inner Picture Stories, and countless of others who have made it their life's purpose to help, who are looking to help you. Don't stop yourself from living the life you deserve. With those words, I am glad you took the time to listen to this episode. I truly hope that it helped you. With that, I hope to have you join me again next time for another episode of the Inner Picture Stories podcast. This is your host, Yelis Fass, signing out. Until next time, everyone. <laughs>